do that properly, I'm going to jump back even before the 60s. Um, many of you know the, the, look, the, the, the image of, of Hugh Lacain, um, and some of you who are just seeing his, his countenance for the first time, uh, he, he was, you know, I, I could have said, well, you know, John Weinswein was the one that sort of pulled it all together, or before John, you know, Healy Willen or Sir Ernest McMillan, but really I think I've chosen Hugh as my starting point because um, uh, the interface between technology, uh, we'll hear him speaking about technology, virtuosity, and art making uh, seem to be encapsulated in, in his work. Oh. Okay. So let's start with some music. I have quite a few musical examples today. Um, I just recognize some faces in the, in the crowd who will recognize this music, but I'm sure some of you have never heard Dripsody. Who's heard Dripsody before? Yeah, a few people. Okay. So a few that haven't. Most famous, aside from Janus Daw, 
who uh, also <laughs> so Thunder Bay was Port Arthur, Port William. Um, Hugh played a very important role in the Second World World War as a physicist. He he worked with. Uh, National Research Council and, and, and National Defense uh, on the development of uh, sonar uh, and, and particularly uh, the, uh, underwater uh, related uh, 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 research and, and developments. Um, he got involved with radar as well. Uh, but he was a, himself a, an amateur musician. He loved music. He loved to play. He had pretty good, uh, uh, you know, finger skills. And uh, when the war ended, and the uh, National Research Council was looking for things to do with, with all these Canadian scientists, well, he sort of naturally gravitated towards music and, and the development of, of uh, musical instruments. Um, I'm going to play a little clip of Hugh in which he explains his, his philosophy about where the intersection between art and, and performance uh, take place. If you look at the piano works of, of Liszt, for instance, you find that they're overly occupied with virtuosity, which is a similar sort of irrelevant. It's condemnable because in the same way that uh, over-interest in technology is, uh, because it's really irrelevant to the artistic production. However, I think it's a, it's a forgivable fault in present-day composers if they are temporarily over-interested in technology I think they ought to realize that as composers, uh, science is utterly useless to them. Mm -hmm. uh, science as science, but as an inspiring force, uh, they would be very wrong to neglect it. They, they're living in a scientific and technological age, and they ought to be inspired by it. The same way the average person is inspired by looking at the moon and realizing people have been there. But anyway, that uh, dramatized very successfully the nature of the, the special problems that I think belong really only to this age. The, the wheel may have been a great dramatic invention, and, uh, but it didn't have the impact on the, the daily life of uh, everybody that the present day, the invention of the transistor did, for instance, or, or interplanetary travel. And certainly it's true that uh, Artists uh, want contact with uh, the physical side of their instruments. Uh, Bach was keenly interested in, in his own instruments, and he uh, repaired his own organs and invented new ones. And the, the genius of the artist is to connect uh, virtuosity and, and high technical efficiency with, uh, with emotionality. So there you have a very succinctly kind of the focus of this, this whole presentation, the intersection of uh, performance, virtuosity, uh, creation in music, and technology. Um, I mean, he was, he was, he was a, a gift to, to, this, to this society, to this culture, and to this field. Um, it wasn't long before uh, he had started uh, producing his instruments. There was a a, a cornerstone grants from the federal government allowed the establishment of the, uh, well, first his lab at National Research Council, and then the U University of Toronto Electronic Music Studio, which opened in, in 1959, uh, just two years after the Columbia Princeton Electronic Studio. So that makes it the second North American uh, uh, electronic studio to have come into existence. Uh, this man, you see, with his hands on the keys, that's Arnold Walter, who was dean of the faculty of music at the time. Uh, Arnold Walter was a famous musicologist, uh, actually was also a composer, has a number of, of published piano sonatas and songs and so on. Um, the fact that the dean embraced this new experimental medium with, with such uh, uh, enthusiasm made a huge difference. Uh, to its, its, its developing and, 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 and becoming a magnet for, for talent. Uh, the man watching on there is uh, Myron Schaefer, who was the, uh, the first director of the, the U of T Electronic Music Studio. And um, Myron um, was, at least for himself, quite a prolific composer. But uh, I think his, his gift was, was to provide that kind of leadership that, uh, uh, as 
as technology developed, uh, you know, he, he, let's face it, with, with, with projects like this, you have to have money. So you always need somebody to, you know, be knocking on the dean's door and, and uh, uh, putting the, making the case for, for, for providing the, uh, the resources for this uh, activity. Um, Robert Aitken, I think most of us in this room know Robert Aitken. Uh, Robert came to the studio in, in 1963. Okay, so we're in the 60s now. Uh, Myron Schaefer uh, brought him in. I mean, Bob was uh, already as a teenager. You know, he was playing at, at uh, uh, you know, concert virtuoso level, playing the flute. Uh, but uh, Bob also, very early in his life, uh, sh showed the talent uh, for composition, and uh, with this uh, exciting new medium um, uh, emerging, he, um, uh, he, you know, he was curious. He, he knocked on that door, and he was welcomed in. Um, I'm going to play a little uh, excerpt here um, of a piece Bob wrote with Myron Schaefer. It's called Noasis. Um, um, I'm going to skip ahead here, just a few. So this is the this is the studio, and I'm just gonna we're gonna go back. Uh, I'm skipping ahead to to show you uh, what what it was Myron and, and Bob would be working with. So there you see is a, a more advanced version of the special purpose tape player. It has a housing now, and it's a, like a, it looks like a proper instrument. Uh, those panels against the wall, those are the serial uh, structured generators. They were. Uh, programmable uh, control voltages. Um, you see here there's multi-track tape players, uh, there's voltage control oscillators, there's voltage control filters. Uh, you can see up on top there's some test equipment. Um, uh, so let's go back to Bob here. I'm going to let you, uh, oops, we're going the wrong way. No? Getting quite a preview here. <laughs> okay, there. Uh, this is just a short excerpt of, of Bob's piece, uh, Noasis. And before I play it, so you'll hear, for example, uh, white noise filtered. You'll hear it shaped and contoured through the, the use of amplifiers and filters. You'll hear just kind of bare, exposed, basic oscillators. Uh, you'll, you'll hear pitch shifting, and basically all of those, those uh, you know, gadgets you saw there in the, in the, the picture of the studio. Um, it was the expressive material of the, of the time in this medium. Um, you'll see what I mean. So, um, 
you know, it's obviously it, 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 it has a great deal of sophisticated uh, musical shaping, but you can tell that the uh, the, the the medium, uh, you know, it, what, what would be the term? It's it's not that it's archaic. It's it's just that it's 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 a musical creation using using a, a, a new and, and maybe not completely understood uh, uh, source and and, 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 and toolkit. Uh, but the important thing here with, with Robert was that uh, here we have a very accomplished young performer, a uh, person who has is, is totally uh, uh, found his way into the, uh, into the world of, of professional music, is a soloist in, in great demand. Um, what happened around those, those times was uh, a means for presenting new music. Uh, was was found. Uh, this slide shows a, a sample of 10 centuries concerts. Uh, this is a series that ran throughout this, the, the 1960s, from about 62 to, to 69. Um, I apologize that it's probably not terribly easy to read for those of you, especially for the back. But um, uh, it mentions here the, the first. Well, of course, 10 centuries concert sort of gives you the idea of what what the philosophy was all about. So we have uh, the Plautus Mariae, so a medieval uh, music drama, an intermission. Um, uh, then we have Synchronisms number one, Mario Davidovsky for flute and tape, Robert Aikens, a soloist. We have two-part invention number three, Gustav Schwager. Okay, I have to tell you, uh, Byron Schaefer died, had a massive heart attack, and just died in 1965. It was, it was you know, uh, a shock. Um, but fortunately, Gus Shimaga was, who had opened a studio at Brandeis University, uh, a Canadian, uh, he became available, and uh, so he, this, this is a program from uh, 1967. So Gus had just arrived probably the year before. Um, so his state composition was included. Elegy and Two Went to Sleep by Norma Beecroft. Um, for flute, percussion, soprano, and, uh, and tape. Um, Mary Morrison, Robert Aitken, Hugh Barclay. Another intermission. Then back to Shimanovsky. Uh, and finally, Ispanajo uh, Cento. So, obviously, a, a, a way of trying to find a method of programming where uh, there's a, an effective mi mixture between new and old, between, um, I mean, they declared their, their, their operating territory as 10th century, so, I mean, pretty, pretty limitless, I would say. Uh, but um, uh, it was, Clearly, responding to the need with all this creative activity going on, uh, you know, answers that question: How are you? How are you going to use this content? How are you going to uh, uh, present this to an audience? So this was a, okay. So there's some interesting things about 10th century concerts. I spoke to Bob Aitken uh, about how they operated. First of all, everybody played for an honorarium, 50 bucks. Uh, secondly. Uh, houses were full. They sold out every concert. Um, uh, the programming was not done by an artistic director. It was done by a, a, a creative uh, committee. Although as time went on, uh, Murray Schaefer uh, sort of emerged as the uh, sort of the lead programmer. Um, and it's also interesting how it came so abruptly to an end. Uh, this. This was the 1967 uh, uh, one of one of those programs. Um, the um, it ran for one more year. And apparently, with all of the uh, the Canada centenary uh, activity and all of the opportunities to do new work to to uh, you know partake in the in the centenary celebrations, um, um, people just sort of were occupied. As simple as that. Um, so, and, and furthermore, um, uh, well, there was change in the wind. Um, 
First of all, there were other voices. Uh, this is Udo Kasnitz, uh, a name that's uh, well known around the music gallery. He was very active uh, throughout his life. Uh, he was a pianist. He was a composer. He was he was a, a writer, a critic, um, and um, uh, in 1968 he. Uh, he presented a, a festival, which was called the, um, just a second, I have to read it because it's, it's Sight Sound Systems Festival, a four-day festival. Um, you won't be able to read this, but I'll read for you. This is, Cassius wants to blow your mind, musically. Uh, if you can see, that's William Littler, 1968. Uh, I'll just quote uh, from the sort of second column here. It says, the kids have grown up in an environment of immediate and simultaneous information. Light shows and electronic manipulation are already part of their lives. They even carry their sound around with them. Trans to radios. It's like a snail carrying his house. They're not necessarily worried about the individual songs. They want the sound. So the music listening situation is changing. Concert Hall will remain a museum. I mean, this is in the best sense. And the new music will have, have to find new performance situations. Enter sight sound system. Um, present day music is aiming for a completely different kind of involvement from that of the concert hall. And art and technology are working hard in hand to bring it about. And we, so we've already organized state sound system uh, to, to illustrate this. So anyway, um, here we have again this kind of tug of war between uh, doors being opened by technology uh, in a continuum of, of uh, you know, classical music performance, and uh, these intersections caused interesting, interesting things to happen. Um, I mean, Kasmus. Um, it was a phenomenal force in the community, like like Aitken, uh, you know, like Beecroft, like you know, the names are are are, are numerous. Uh, but um, uh, I think what he was doing here sort of signaled to the community that you know, there's more than 10 centuries concerts. There's there are other approaches, and of course, Cadmus was very closely aligned with Cage, uh, with Marcel Duchamp. Uh, and uh, with a, a very, very different direction uh, aesthetically. Okay, so here's the studio once again. Now, Norma Beecroft. Um, Norma, um, okay, Norma had been involved in 10th century concerts. Um, uh, Norma was a composer, is a composer. Norma, she's still composing, she's still active. Um, um, uh, her father was an inventor. Um, she grew up in, a, in, a, in an environment where uh, uh, innovation and, and creativity was was uh, was encouraged. Um, Norma took to, to the gear like just just like that. Um, uh, Nor Norma and Bob uh, had both been involved with the Ten Centuries concerts. And all it took for them to get together to, to create new music concerts uh, was uh, a phone call from Hugh Davidson, who was the uh, music officer at the Canada Council at the time. You see, in 1967, on the, on the, uh, 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 the ripples of the centenary uh, activity in Montreal, the SMCQ had started itself. And, um, uh, Rather famously so, they, you know, immediately were, were uh, well attended, and uh, Serge Garot, the artistic director in Montreal, uh, uh, you know, was a fantastic conductor, a, a brilliant programmer, uh, and they were able to attract audiences. So uh, Hugh Davidson, um, and I, this is the story I get from from Bob Aitken, is. Uh, I mean, he tells the story better than I can tell it, but he's kind of coy. He said, you know, uh, we're giving that money to support SMCQ in Montreal. You know, the politics of the situation are, there probably should be 
somebody in Toronto, and there probably should be a society in Vancouver. So all you really need to do is ask for us. <laughs> <laughs> and so Bob and Norma did just that. They got together and, uh, and they established uh, new music concerts. Um, the, the opening concert took place uh, in January of uh, 1971. Um, excuse me, 72. They, they established themselves in 71 as, a, as an entity. They got their funding. Uh, they, their opening concert was with Luciano Berrio. Uh, they brought him over from Italy. Um, I don't have a slide to show you because the, uh, <laughs> what you see is a, a red blob. Uh, they, wanted, they wanted to start with people. They wanted to make a statement. Uh, well, I can sort of, you can see what it looks like on, on paper. Is that pretty? Uh, yeah, here it is. <laughs> it's just that they're opening. <laughs> they had the resources suddenly to, to, to do fancy things and they, they, they really kind of went wild with it. Uh, uh, actually, what, you wouldn't be able to read this, but uh, what it does, what it does uh, betray is that these concerts took place in the concert hall of the University of Toronto. And this is, this is an important um, um, component of the, of the history. Uh, Ten centuries concerts had also uh, uh, staged their, their concerts uh, in, in this fairly new, recently constructed concert hall. It's now Walter Hall, but in those days it hadn't been dedicated to Arnold Walter. So uh, this was uh, the concert hall at the University of Toronto. And um, how are we doing for time back there? You're oh, you're, you're, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so um, uh, it's important to understand that the heritage of this activity was all centered around the university, and the fact the electronic music studio was there, and there were composers from all corners of the globe coming uh, to take advantage of, of, of this new technology and this new creative resource. Uh, they were gravitating towards the U of T. Uh, this would not remain the case for very long, but w while we're here, there was a guy who came in 1970. <laughs> I don't know, it looks vaguely familiar. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, while here, I <laughs> learned the analog tape techniques in the studio and uh, uh, and I, I, I met Jim Montgomery who is uh, amongst us. Uh, we both, there were, fortunately there were two studios. There was Studio A, Studio C. Uh, the Studio C was, we refer to it as the big kid studio. Uh, it was supposed to be reserved for more senior artists, people like Stockhausen, like Berio, like uh, Mimiraglo, people who were invited to come in and, and create pieces in the studio. The kids, the young students should be in Studio A learning their, their, their craft and their trade. Well, um, uh, it wasn't long before we decided to take the stuff out of the studio. <laughs> um, this is uh, Jim and, and, and me in 1970. Uh, the studio had just uh, uh, acquired its first uh, EMS, Synthi A, and um, so, you know, if you put yourself in that time frame where the difference between, you know, this, <laughs> where the final result was a recording on tape, which you'd play back in the concert hall, versus something you could play, you know, on stage or, or live, well, wouldn't you know, I have an example. <laughs> Oops, sorry. This is Norma's piece. I, I skipped over it. Here, we'll come back to Norma.
Okay, so maybe not the most complex structure, but performed live. Um, oh yes, thank you. Uh, Barbara Schneider is her name. Barbara moved on to Calgary. She was a member of the uh, Calgary Philharmonic. And um, yes, and she was, had a lot of courage, <laughs> you know, to hang out with these guys and expose herself to, uh, you know, a possible artistic disaster. <laughs> um, uh, is that piece composed or is it? That, in fact, the score for that piece exists on the uh, music gallery, you know, the postcard set? No. Some of you have seen those. There's about a couple hundred of them, different artists who, yeah, it was scored, but it was kind of scored as a flow chart. So it showed how interactions could 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 be allowed. And, um, um, so is there a certain improvisational element? There is, yes. There is definitely a freedom to, to, to interpret as you go. Um, I want to back up just a little bit here. Um, back to Norma. So, um, Norma was busy working at the CBC at the time uh, on a show that she made with Harry Summers called Music of Today. By the way, those uh, tape machines they were actually uh, donated by, this, by CBC Radio to the studio. Um, you know, they, <laughs> this always happens, you know, they, they upgraded, they got a better model. What do we do with these? Well, I know some, some people at the university could use them. Um, I think that was the last time, actually, that CBC Radio had much to do with uh, supporting the studio. But um, uh, in any case, I should acknowledge that. Um, um, Norma was actually the first, call it, senior composer, person uh, actually practicing in the field uh, to take an interest in, in one of my pet projects, which was uh, digital synthesis. So um, uh, while I was doing my master's degree, uh, Gus Shimaga uh, found uh, some means to, uh, to buy some computer time over at the U of T uh, Computer Music Center. And um, uh, together we, uh, we installed this program. Uh, it was modeled on a, a University of Arizona uh, Fortran program, which was called Perform. And we thought we should call it, because it was then highly rewritten and, and modified, we thought it should be called Of U of T, so outperform. Uh, <laughs> Corny, I know, but uh, so Norma was uh, uh, at that time. You know, new music concerts was it was a new venture. It was going strong, uh, highly visible, and so she wrote this piece. Uh, it's actually commissioned by John Roberts at CBC Radio called "Peace for Bob." That was the track I skipped over, and um, let's see if I can.
Okay, we just arrived back at the, uh, the, the kind of the, the readdressing the first thing I said tonight, which was the marriage of uh, music creativity, composition, uh, virtuosity, and technology. So here already, um, this uh, work is called Peace for Bob. Uh, 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 Bob Aiken has, has performed it dozens of times. Um, and um, so in this case, all right, so the electronic part was ground out by a mainframe computer overnight, you know, about you know, 10 seconds at a time per session, and then, you know, then, you know, added to, uh, compiled together on, on tape machines. Um, the performance element obviously was a brilliant soloist, um, but that brings me back to the, the previously, previously made point, which why not do it live? So, of course, Jim and I were having fun uh, and in the studio, and it wasn't possible for others not to notice. So before you know it, uh, a couple other guys had joined in. You know, more or less, uh, we like to have that fun, too. Uh, this is the CEE. Uh, David Grimes, Larry Lake, Jim, and, and me. Uh, so we uh, actually gave our first concert uh, in, um, in 1971, summer of 19, August 1971. Um, this, is, uh, this is Music Gallery Editions, MGE 8. This happened a little bit later, but um, what, was, what we were aspiring to was to uh, create a body of work uh, which was live performable. Um, and um, in 1973, we recorded the first track. Uh, this, this was not released until later, but I'll give you a sample of that very first uh, track that we recorded. Um, here's the back cover. By this time, we had a bunch of these Sundays. Uh, <laughs> composer performers, a quartet, um, everybody playing a part. These are still monophonic instruments, by the way. Um, one note at a time. Mind you, that note could be as complex as you could design. So these were works that were rehearsed, collectively composed, and, um, and presented live in performance.
Okay, so there are some new elements in the mix here. Uh, you know, uh, and there was another one. In 1969, Sterling Beckwith was given a mandate at, uh, to create a music department at York University. This is David Rosenboom. Uh, Sterling came over from um, uh, Sunny State University of New York, Buffalo, where they, they came up with this concept of um, comprehensive musicianship. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't just have professors, they had creative associates. And this had been so inspiring for Sterling that he, he brought some of those creative associates to York. Uh, David Rosenboom, uh, and of course, now, so they wanted to build a studio. By this time, they could just, they could just buy it. <laughs> uh, this, this is the ARP uh, 3600. Uh, David is a, David, by the way, has become, uh, has been dean of CalArts. Uh, he subs, uh, succeeded uh, Morton Sabotnik. He's been there for about 30 years as dean. Um, oops, I got, I got wrong. Uh, Casey Sokol, who uh, was, is, remains to be not only a superb uh, improviser, but a person who was able then to teach improvisation, to, to show his students what they needed to think about, what they needed to do uh, to improvise. Um, before long, well, I'm, I'm now in, in uh, the other gentleman's story, but CCMC, uh, uh, well, as you can see, Casey in the doorway there, you can see Navi Kubota next to him, you see Michael Snow on the other side, uh, Peter Anson, uh, uh, Larry Gubin, Al Mattis. Um, Bill Smith. Sorry? Bill Smith. Bill Smith. And Greg Coffrey. And Greg, yes. So, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, with this whole idea of making music, you know, off the score uh, seemed to really kind of uh, develop at York. And I, I have to think that, you know, Jim and Larry and David Grimes and I, we, you know, we kind of came out of U of T, but I've got to tell you that very first year of the music gallery, uh, we gave a concert of improvisation, electronic, live electronic improvisation at the music gallery. And I like to think that these two traditions were somehow blended together. Uh, you know, we had left U of T, we had all the trappings of the U of, U of T composers, uh, but you know, we hung out with, with these other guys who had interesting stuff to, to do as well. And the Glass Orchestra also came out of this tradition. Um, uh, students of Casey Sokol, who uh, uh, studied the art of improvisation with Casey, they, had, they, they formed this uh, improvisation group called YIMPA, York Improvis Improvisational Agreement. Um, I, I know we're out of time, David. <laughs> Looking at you, I, I, I'm sorry I couldn't jam more of this into less time, but I thought it was important to hear some of the music. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on a glass orchestra track, and we can just kind of have questions or however you like to wrap up, David. Uh, <coughs> this is actually uh, from a, a rehearsal set uh, recorded live. Uh, 